variety of investment hypothesis and, and very clearly articulated specific strategies, um, even in, say, our, our sector of infrastructure. Well, come on, define that more, more clearly. What, what exactly do you mean by infrastructure? What subsectors? What are the characteristics of the businesses that you're investing in? Why? How are you going to add value to them? Um, so I think sort of relatively sophisticated set of questions, sort of similar questions you'd expect. I think if you were, you know, a European L uh, GP, you know, really looking at the the detail of our business model and it's uh, it's the level of differentiation and the sustainability and the uh, deliverability of that that model being the being the key questions rather than you know why should we invest in Southeast Asia? I think they've already now made that decision. Um, they wouldn't be coming and knocking on on Sandy's door if, if that was still a, an issue for them. Hello, sir. Fundraising not a problem? <laughs> yeah, fundraising is pretty easy. I just ring up Treasury and they uh, send the <laughs> check around. So. Charles balance sheet. <laughs> just pass it on. So, uh, yeah, I'm, a, I'm in a fortunate position. From <laughs> what do you think, Yo? Remain calm. Okay. Progress. Fundraising. Okay. If you smell the smoke, guys, yeah, we'll, know what to do. we'll follow you out. Yeah. Um, yeah so, uh, yes, fundraising uh, is blissful easy because uh, we're a captive and funded from the bank's balance sheet. But having said that, yeah, a couple of observations. We, alongside us in uh, principal finance, we have an infrastructure fund which uh, has raised money from third parties, and so they've. Um, uh, they're pretty close to the market, and they're probably going to be out there again later this year, raising the second fund. Uh, and interestingly, they have seen from their LPs who they're in close contact with a shift in appetite during the course of the fund. So initially, I think there was considerable skepticism about the infrastructure equi uh, equity opportunity in Southeast Asia. In the last year or so, they found the LPs saying, well, okay, yeah, we don't mind uh, actually taking a look at some of these propositions, whereas previously it really was at the very periphery of their radar. And, um, and as a result, our infrastructure guys have started to spend more time in, uh, in Southeast Asia and in Indonesia in particular, where there are obviously significant opportunities. Um, so, uh, yeah, we've seen that shifting of risk appetite over the last 12 months. Um, I think the, the other observation I'd make is that we also, through the bank's network, get approaches from sovereigns or quasi-sovereigns who want to co-invest alongside the private equity business. Um, and again, they are particularly interested in some of the longer term plays, such as infrastructural resources in Southeast Asia. Uh, and so those are, those are two themes that are recurring on our side. I guess the, um, the, the, the challenge I'd, I'd put out for others who are in more frequent contact is, yes, we've seen, by the sounds of it, some risk appetite shifting, and, and, and that's gone in our favor as far as the Southeast Asian markets are concerned. I think the challenge, the challenge is actually slightly down the road which is, particularly with buyouts, how do you find exits? Because uh, it's one thing to find the, the investment opportunities, and we can talk a lot about how many there are and, uh, and what sort of size and scale of uh, capital you can deploy. But I think the, uh, uh, the other part of the thesis is, is can you find sufficiently liquid exits when you're in control positions as opposed to minority positions? And, and we yeah. sit in both of those situations, but I, I'd be very interested to hear the views of others because that will be the challenge once we start to deploy bigger amounts of money in the market. Mm. So on exits, so maybe Chiman can talk about, because clearly, you know, once you, in a very timely way, you know, enter a door, you've got to know the exit. <laughs> it's it's, it's so all about the exit, right? Yeah, yeah. The fire alarm comes off, you know where to run to. But tell us about how, <laughs> you, know, how you view uh, what Alistair just said. I think in terms of exit, the, the, the interesting point, I think, for, for Southeast Asia is that there's, you have the combinations of both the IPO and the trade sale option, whereby, let's say, in the case of uh, China, it is really primarily IPO. I mean, much as people talk about trade sale, it is really primarily uh, IPO. So I think for, for, for Southeast Asia, at least there is uh, both that option. Um, from my observation from some of the GPs, uh, my sense is uh, in, in terms of the, let's say, the trade sale, that there, there will be strategics, let's say, from the US or the Europe who who wanted exposure through Asia, and one way is to do it through Southeast Asia. And I have also seen um, 
secondary sales to other PE funds, the larger size PE funds, whereby the local managers sell it to, to, to the regional. And I think that is also provides another options for some of the managers. Dennis, actually, I want to shift gears with you. Um, I wanted to uh, talk about horror stories. I want to tap on your personal <laughs> views as what you've seen uh, go wrong in the last three years. Maybe some of the stuff that you've advised or something that you've observed somebody else do. Uh, don't need to name them, but what have you seen as a personal horror story and say, man, if we could have done that differently, we could have. And I'm going to shift that down down the road as well. Uh, absolutely nothing that I've actually worked on. So. Absolutely. All I could say, <laughs> of course, but 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 anecdotally, what we've seen from others, um, you know, I I think some of the, I mean, there's there's a lot of stories going into the financial crisis, and and some of them are, are Asian. And gentlemen, your attention, please. This is one of those. We have yeah. investigated the situation and found it to be a false alarm. Thank you. Yeah. Yay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I I, I think most of the horror stories that that I've See, or mo most of the really difficult situations and sort of managing a transaction after, you know, post buyout, pre exit, uh, it, it all comes down to the initial due diligence. And, and so I don't know if that's, you know, I, I mean, there's certainly more of these stories because of the financial crisis, because the world dropped out and all of a sudden nobody was hitting their, their growth targets and, and it was hard to pay back debt. Uh, but I, I think it's, it's not necessarily a lesson that, that only has applicability because of the crisis. I think if you don't go into a deal doing your due diligence, uh, then there's a high possibility. Uh, you know, you're basically crossing your fingers that nothing's wrong. And so I have seen deals where, uh, you know, there were oral agreements sort of, you know, across the board that the buyer didn't know about and, and you know, they, they didn't hire the right consultants to go and talk to the franchisees and the next thing you know, you know, there's, there's liabilities that are significantly greater than you ever thought and, the, and you write down the, the investment to zero. So, you know, I, I think there's, I mean, there's probably too many examples to think of specifically, but it really does all come down to taking your time up front and not short-circuiting the due diligence process. Hmm. Okay. And hire a good lawyer, of course. <laughs> Absolutely. Either before or after. <laughs> and during. Um, Alistair? Obviously nothing that you've been through. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, over the years I've seen uh, I've seen one or two. I don't know whether they're horror stories. I, I guess I've described them more like trips to the dentist, um, where uh, you know you know when you get up in the morning there's going to be some pain involved, uh, but you've still got to do it. And um, uh, and interestingly, if I think of the instances, and again, yeah, we won't name names, but the, the, the situations which have not gone according to plan and have become like trips to the dentist. I don't think that the lawyers ultimately would have uh, would have been able to stop that happening. Well, unless you had a sort of marriage lawyer as opposed to a corporate lawyer, because I think most of the issues are down to um, has the working relationship been established with whether it's uh, the the management team themselves or the sponsor shareholder, and um, uh, the legal documents are helpful in terms of rehearsing the the bigger picture stuff. But but actually, it's about have you got a working relationship? Can you find ways of testing what happens when, that, when the business gets stressed? Often it is about can you effect change at the right pace? You know, if the business is put under stress, as we went through in the GFC, um, is that management team responsive enough? Will they take the tough decisions? And we, we sit sometimes in a control position with other institutions and sometimes in a pure minority position. And I have to say that the, you won't be surprised to hear the weaker situations are those where we're in a minority and we can only affect change slowly because uh, we can persuade and cajole, but ultimately we don't have the uh, ability to change out a management team because we are not in control. And, um, uh, and that's a weak position when what you really need is crisis management. So those are the situations where could we have avoided getting into them in the first place? Um, yeah, I guess if, uh, if we spent a bit more time working with the, uh, the management and the sponsors on how collectively are we going to respond to points of stress? Um, and as I said, that's, that's, that's kind of relationship counseling, not corporate counseling, but, uh, uh, but those have been the origins of our uh, trips to the dentist. Can I, can I just, uh, on, on the flip side of that, you know, uh, sort of the, the growth capital investments where you're in a minority position versus the buyouts, um, you're, you're right that you can't affect change. On the other hand, especially if you've got shareholders who are just walking away completely from the company, in a buyout kind of situation, uh, 
that's really where there's risk that, that you're not going to have recourse against them and they just sort of, you know, they, they completely disappear. So, so I, I guess, it, you know, where you can do buyouts in Southeast Asia, there are obviously jurisdictions where it's difficult to get 100% because you can't squeeze out the minority or, or for other reasons. And in talking to somebody the other day about this panel and talking about buyouts, and, and we were talking about a particular jurisdiction which will remain nameless where it, basically there are not many buyouts done. And this person said to me, look, and it was, a, it was a banker, he said, look, if somebody wanted to sell you 100% of a company in this jurisdiction, you should be asking yourself why. So. Yeah. I see. David, horror story. <laughs> Um, uh, well, I, I was working in Europe when a lot of these mistakes were being made, not by me, obviously, but, um, <laughs> and uh, I, I would actually pick up on the point that Dennis made. I mean, the, the real mistakes were made through lack of due diligence, and not because people weren't capable of due diligence. They just weren't given the access to the businesses. There was such a frenzy. There was so much competition for, for assets. Um, the way the investment bankers very cleverly ran processes basically eliminated the ability to do genuine and deep due diligence, um, didn't allow you to, uh, to get to know the management team and do some of this stress testing and actually form a view as to whether they were capable of reacting to, um, to, to, to a change in circumstances and lo and behold, I mean, clearly the global financial crisis was a, a, a scale of, uh, of dislocation that, that nobody could have, uh, could have anticipated. But there was just not the opportunity to form judgments on, on the management teams, um, let alone you know, how the businesses were going to react to that. So, look, I think I sincerely hope we don't get into that kind of mode here in, here in Southeast Asia where, you know, I... I actually feel the issues here, why isn't there a bigger, op bigger market here? It's, it's not because of lack of capital, even today. I think it's, it's more driven by, by lack of opportunities. Um, and if we get into a position where um, these processes are being run in a way that doesn't, don't allow investors to do proper and deep due diligence, I think we'll see a number of, of big mistakes being made because that's the consequence of of buying something you don't really understand. So um, that's that, that, that would be, from, from my perspective, the, uh, the origin of a number of the horror stories that, that we've seen in, okay. in Europe. So do your due diligence. Don't take a deal from investment bankers. Sandy? <laughs> Agree. <laughs> <laughs> All two. <laughs> Agree. Uh, we've been fortunate, Chris. Um, to um, not to have uh, this type of horror stories. Although, if uh, uh, now that you, you're asking the questions, there was one particular situation whereby we were um, looking at a situation brought by an investment banker on a very uh, non-traditional basis. We don't participate a lot in in uh, uh, auction type, but this is in oil and gas. And oops. But anyway, <laughs> uh, the deal got closed uh, basically one week before Lehman um, collapsed. So as a result, the, the winning bidder was, uh, you know, have to go through a lot of uh, uh, problem. But long story short, I think it goes back to control and it goes back to your partner, especially in, in the part of uh, the regions that we're we're doing transactions. It's very, very important to have good partner on the ground who have uh, sincerity and integrity to carry out. And if it's if you're not in the control, it's very difficult. And that's why we first and foremost we want to be in the control positions. If we're minority, the CFO must be appointed by us. Right. So that's that's really a lesson learned from from that. Okay. Um, I think we've got our ticker on. Um, and I'd like to take this time to open up uh, questions to the floor. Do you have any questions for our distinguished panel? Okay, I guess, oh, we have one. You get a present. 
Um, well, thank you. Interesting comments. I mean, I, I guess to come back to the, the topic of control, I just wonder if the panel could comment on, you know, sort of legal control versus de facto control. I, you, know, you may argue for a long time with, with, your, uh, with your partner or your sponsors about getting the right to, to make changes or change management, but in reality, that's actually rather difficult to, to implement. I think, in, especially in the situations that we're in, uh, it's definitely 50% plus one share would, would makes us comfortable and not only de jure, but also de facto, whereby we have uh, basically majority in the board of directors and board of commissioners in the case of Indonesian companies and in the case of, uh, for instance, Singapore companies, we would have also majority in the board of directors, both non-executive and executive. So, um, but also, not only uh, having that type of, of control, but rather uh, down to the line, in, uh, for instance, the CFO that you appoint must be able to interact and uh, uh, be accepted by, by the entire management team. Because uh, we have a situations whereby, uh, you know, we appointed a CFO and there was tension. Uh, and uh, there was a, basically non-acceptance by, by, by the company because uh, he would not be, uh, he, would, he would adopt the Western style. So culture is very important um, that in, in some of these uh, uh, countries, uh, very, very important to understand the local cultures. So if you come in and bang, 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 using the uh, bang table, using the, the Western style, sometimes you may have the de facto and de jure control but uh, actually you don't have the vote from, from the entire management team uh, to have it. So uh, we use, uh, uh, by the use of local partner, it will e uh, ease up the situations and this uh, actually can be, uh, can be greatly enhanced if you understand the, the local culture and be on the ground. Sounds like underground presence is very key, which is true. Um, any other questions? I had a question more about the, uh, the history of, of, of the private equity industry in Southeast Asia. Um, and I think a couple of speakers pointed out that it has been around for almost 20 years now. Um, somehow it doesn't register uh, on the scale of Wicca. It's not an appropriate comparison, but it, it, it doesn't really register, at least from where I'm coming from. Uh, and. How, in, in, in the view of the practitioners, you are all in the private equity, beyond private equity in Southeast Asia, but you have been longer there. You know, how substantive is it, and, and, and what is the history that has been waged? Because I was at Franklin Templeton Derby before, and we did buy a fund uh, following the 97, 98 crisis. You know, so uh, we had the impression that the industry was, had collapsed here, and, and, and we, we could pick the pieces. What, what is the industry? industry's history. How substantive is it? You know, uh, is it now taking off again or is it still building on what had been there before? Maybe I'll direct that question to, to Chiman as a, as a fund, of fund operator in the region. How he's uh, actually, I mean, you, you, this is a great point because, I mean, personally as a Singaporean, I always find sort of sad that, I mean, the Asia P sort of started in Southeast Asia and then within the last five to ten years, it was overshadowed by uh, China and India and now everybody talks about China and India and sort of forget that there is that Southeast Asia P, which is actually is very much alive, and it actually provides both the growth part and the control buyout part, whereby in like China and India, you don't have that, that breadth of investment activities. But um, coming back to, 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 your, to your comments on, on this, I think um, what we see in the last five years was a number of Southeast Asia focus fund managers shifting their focus to uh, India and China, and in fact, some some of the recent funds they actually did as even more on this other regions other than Southeast Asia, and 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 I think it is important to remain focused and to know the strength. And if you remain focused and do good deals and do good work, um, there is always interest in this region. Much as I mean, much as in in the last few years, it was to quote easier to make money in. China and India.
but I think uh, remaining focus is a very important element. Any other comments? Yeah, I, I would just add really quickly to that. Um, I, I guess this maybe goes back to one of the earlier presentations about whether ASEAN is really a region, whether you know whether these jurisdictions can you invest in a, a Southeast Asia buyout fund, and does that make sense?